PG-13, PG-13, PG-13. Don't you ever wish that these characters could just let loose and, I don't know, get a bit gritty? Well, I have a theory that that's exactly what's happening right now. Marvel is quietly setting up the dominoes that'll result in their version of an R-rated Avengers. A more mature cast of characters telling scarier, sexier stories for the adult audience. And it all begins here, at the end of Eternals. Adjust those parental settings now, my friends. The MC not for all of you is coming. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the most R-rated family-friendly show that you can find online. Not even joking about that. Have you seen the stuff that we've talked about over the last decade? Murder! But it's okay because it's being done by kooky animatronics. Illegal corporate embezzlement. But don't worry, he's a vigilante with a big heart. Cannibalism. Except everyone's a smoothie and it's happening off screen. Look, it's not just us, either. Marvel has been getting away with this sleight of hand for the last decade, too. Mass planetary genocide? That is is a lot of death, but it's being done by a purple raisin man who snaps his fingers, so no biggie. Child trafficking? Oh, that is a serious topic. But it's being done via a montage during the opening credits, so we good, fam. Want to spend five minutes watching two people compete to end their own lives? When you look at it, literally, that scene for the Soul Stone has some very disturbing connotations. But, you know, it led to the highest grossing movie of all time, so who are we to judge? All I'm saying is that the MCU has found a lot of different ways to get R-rated content into people. PG-13 packages, but now the times they are a-changing. Older, more violent Marvel projects like Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and the show that shall not be named recently transitioned over to Disney Plus in a move that required everyone logging in to set age gates on their accounts. The Eternals featured the universe's first ever round of, um, extremely passionate kissing. And what an awkward tonal shift that one was. And with Deadpool now wearing mouse ears thanks to Disney's acquisition of Fox, we have ourselves a definitive R-rated superhero movie coming down the pipeline, but I don't think we're gonna have to wait that long. I actually think the transition is happening now. Well, in other theories, I've been laser-focused on the arrival of the Young Avengers and a rival faction of Dark Avengers. Over in Disney Plus land, I think there's something else cooking. A more mature breed of content. It's a rollout that started with Eternals, but kicked into high gear last week with the arrival of Moon Knight. Ladies and gentlemen, we're approaching the arrival of the R-rated Avengers. Of course, they're not gonna be called that, but I think I know what they will be called. And in order to understand what dominoes are being set up, we first have to talk about Blade. Someone is always trying to ice skate up hill. Wow, that was, haha, <laughs> that was a very different era for Marvel movies. Now, it might have slipped your mind since, you know, we've had other things to worry about over the past few years, but back at the 2019 San Diego Comic Con, Marvel was taking its big post endgame victory lap by announcing they plan to keep taking victory laps, rolling out literally dozens of celebrities onto stage while announcing a whole slew of new movies to assert their continued domination over the box office. And then, in the final minute, MCU mastermind Kevin Feige pulled this one out. But I want to leave you today with one more thing. Ladies and gentlemen, two-time Academy Award winner, Mahershala Ali. <laughs> A new incarnation of Marvel's iconic vampire-hunting superhero, Blade. Why would that be such a big deal? Well, before Iron Man and Thor became household names, perhaps the biggest, most beloved Marvel superhero was Blade. In the late 90s, this was the guy with his movie sitting in the top 10 highest grossing superhero movies of all time for a solid five years, standing alongside Batman and Superman until he was eventually knocked out of the rankings by someone you might be familiar with, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. Gonna cry? And let's just say that Blade was a lot more, um, uncompromised than his contemporaries. <laughs> Are you out of your damn mind? These movies were instant cult classics, standing out for being a unique mishmash of sci-fi, horror, and martial arts. All rated R, and all of them pushing the boundaries of what a superhero movie could be. But the thing is, showing up whenever Marvel needs to push the envelope? That's been Blade's thing since the very beginning. Here's some old-time comics trivia for ya. Did you know back in the day you couldn't have vampires, werewolves, or zombies in comic books at all? It's true. In the 1950s, there was a big moral outrage campaign against horror comics. Like the hugely popular tale 
Tales from the Crypt series. This led to Senate hearings deciding whether to ban them. Instead of leaving it in the government's hands, the comics industry established the Comics Code Authority, a regulatory board that imposed strict rules on anything that was going to be published. And I do mean strict. Under their guidance, villains weren't allowed to be sympathetic or victorious, cops weren't allowed to be incompetent, and the words weird and terror weren't allowed in titles at all. They would have had a field day with YouTube titles. Anyway, these guidelines were so intense that entire genres of imaginary monsters couldn't even be mentioned because they were too closely associated with no-no topics like Satanism and the occult. Zombies? Gone. Vampires? Gone. That's why Spider-Man's 1960s man who turns into a man-shaped wolf nemesis is called the Man-Wolf instead of, you know, the Wolf-Man. It's also why he gets his powers from a moon rock instead of the full moon, because he is definitely, absolutely not a werewolf. That would be the occult. But by the mid-1970s, that Comics Code Authority had gone bye-bye thanks in no small part to Marvel themselves pushing for it when Stan Lee wanted to run a story about drug use in The Amazing Spider-Man. Marvel Publishing, who'd already discovered the benefits of aiming books at a more mature, or at least an older teenage audience, very quickly jumped back into the horror comics game with grabby titles like Son of Satan, Werewolf by Night, and in 1973, Tomb of Dracula, which introduced the world to none other than Blade and all his gory, blood-soaked beheading vampire glory. So, you see the pattern emerging here, right? It was one thing for the Blade movies to be doing their thing back in the 90s when Marvel characters were all at different studios, and he could do his R-rated bloody vampire stuff away from everyone else. But now that the Marvel Universe is, in fact, a universe, a connected, unified, shared one, it starts to look difficult to see where someone like Blade, or the Punisher, or Ghost Rider, or even the grittier Netflix MCU fits in. I mean, urban violence in Daredevil, assault and abuse in Jessica Jones, racism and police violence in Luke Cage, that's a serious problem when the MCU umbrella has historically been known as general audience appropriate. I mean, sure, a vampire show doesn't need to be adults only, but a PG-13 Blade movie is just inviting the thousand Disney-ruined Blade videos here on YouTube with clickbait thumbnails of Wesley Snipes' headshot and a big ol' anime tear rolling down his cheek. It feels like Disney needs a brand for this new breed of mature stuff, a playlist header on the Disney Plus feed to indicate the adult-oriented content. I mean, right now when you log on and look under Marvel, you literally see everything. So how do you delineate the ask your parents permission safe search off Marvel stuff? Well, what about the K-word? No, 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 I, I I meant night, night, silent K word. Get your mind out of the gutter, you weirdo. The Marvel Knights is a brand identity that Marvel Comics has used a number of times over the years to designate mature audience or high-end titles separate from its mainline publishing. It's also been the branding for a line of animated motion comics, the production banner for Punisher and Ghost Rider movies, and it's the book name of a short-lived unnamed team formed by Daredevil to fight against the Punisher, consisting of himself, Shang-Chi, Black Widow, Moon Knight, and Luke Cage. In short, the word knight has, in the history of Marvel, tended to denote the content that involves its more edgy characters. And look at who we've just been introduced to in Marvel's most recent outing, Moon Knight. For a history of Moon Knight, he was like Blade, a horror comic character introduced back in the days of those banned series. Specifically, Werewolf by Night, issue number 32. Chances are, if you'd heard of Moon Knight at all before they started advertising the show, it's probably based on a series of memes that re-edited the dialogue from old comic panels into jokes about his random collection of powers. We're trying to shake down Count Drac for money, which is kind of a double meta joke considering that for a horror comic character, Moon Knight actually didn't have anything to do with Marvel's Dracula, which, uh, yes, does in fact exist, and is just Count Dracula. The regular, normal, wears a cape, sleeps in a coffin, lives in a castle in Transylvania, turns into a bat, and drinks blood Dracula. Turns out he just, uh, exists in the worlds of Marvel. Though I do gotta say, it honestly wouldn't surprise me too much if Dracula turned out to be Ethan Hawke's unnamed mystery role from this new show. Anyway, this new series immediately starts off showing you that this isn't your child superhero show, showcasing Disney's newest form of glass slipper, literally glass in your shoe, giving us probably the most extreme Marvel produced moment to date. He's punching werewolves, he's dealing with dissociative identity disorder, there is a reason the show got bumped up to a TV 16 plus rating over in the UK, same as Jessica Jones and Luke Cage, putting it higher than every other non-Netflix series that they've produced so far. We also know that Moon Knight's old frenemy, Werewolf by Night, is getting his own Halloween special 
special this fall. Just saying, between the vampires, werewolves, and guys dressed like mummies, looks like by the time Blade releases in 2023, the MCU will have created the dark universe that Universal Studios failed to get off the ground a few years ago. Now, if we were just talking about these guys, I'd be telling you more about the Midnight Suns, a team of horror and supernatural based characters that handle monsters, ghouls, ghosts, and were basically the Avengers for scary horror movie stuff. The original lineup consisted of Blade, Morbius, Ghost Rider, Mordred the Mystic, and eventually Doctor Strange, with later versions having guys like Moon Knight show up as well to do whatever Moon Knight decided his gimmick was that week. So there's a bunch of spooky horror themed characters rearing their heads in the MCU within the next two to three years, we must be forming the Suns. Except, still doesn't explain why Blade's voice landed a coveted teaser spot at the end of Eternals. Sure you're ready for that, Mr. Whitman? See, this moment at the end of Eternals was weird, and not just because Dane Whitman here, who goes on to become the Black Knight and dates a character named Cersei, is played by the same guy who was Jon Snow in Game of Thrones. Most slam dunk casting decision ever. Now, the reason this teaser is weird from a canonical standpoint is that the Black Knight and his mysterious ebony blade isn't connected to vampire hunting blade at all. He's not one of the Midnight Suns, he didn't debut in Marvel's 70s horror comics like Moon Knight, there is nothing that truly unites these two characters except their maturity ratings. You see, while Moon Knight, Blade, and Werewolf by Night are mature for dealing with scary monsters, the Black Knight is kind of the opposite. He's traditionally the modern day descendant of a renegade knight in Arthurian England, who inherits his ancestor's cursed sword, the Ebony Blade. He then uses it to redeem his family's name by fighting crime dressed as a knight riding a winged horse. He's not really edgy and definitely not violence and gore scary, kinda hard to do when you run around dressed like Edward from Enchanted. No, the reason he's R-rated is because his relationship with Sir wasn't the usual cute MCU thing where adult relationships are envisioned by children. You owe me a dance. I really like you. I really like you too. <laughs> I want one. No. In the 90s, Dane Whitman and Cersei had less subtlety. They definitely had more of a trashy romance novel for mom thing going on. Hot and heavy, hard to miss, big hair, big biceps, big personalities. Seriously though, outside of introducing the world to a seventh infinity stone, the ego stone, this slightly more steamy for mommy and daddy readers romance story is pretty much the reason that either of these characters stayed popular enough through comics most profitable period amongst the likes of Spider-Man, Wolverine, and the Punisher. In a universe where superhero relationships are typically all high school melodrama. I didn't realize you were waiting. I would have joined you, but uh. They used up all the hot water. I should have joined you. Dean and Cersei came off more like grown ups. And today, these two characters were introduced into the world of the MCU via Eternals, the art house MCU film. I started with an image of a macro image of sand. Sight a William Blake poem to see the world in the grain of sand and the heaven in a wild flower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. So there you have it, theorists. Marvel Knights, a mature line of content that'll encompass the MCU's Grown Ups division. It's a name Marvel already has on file. It's one they really like to reuse, and it lines up in the literal sense with the names of both Moon Knight and Black Knight, at least two of the guys that would seemingly fall under said heading. It's one of the only ways to explain the Blade Black Knight connection that started in Eternals, and the branding just kind of fits in a more abstract way with all the other characters who could possibly be looped in. Blade's got himself a sword and deals with ancient enemies. Luke Cage. Daredevil and Punisher all love their respective protectors of the city gates metaphors so they could fall under the mantle too. At this point, when you're Marvel, there's only a certain amount of expansion that you can do. Nothing can be all things to all people all the time, and there's certainly a die-hard audience for darker, different material. Just look at the fan base for the Snyder Cut. This new initiative, I suspect, is their way of capturing that part of the market too. Honestly, I gotta agree with Kate Bishop on this one. Your problem is branding. And when you have such a strong umbrella brand already, you you need to differentiate. You need something to communicate that these projects are gonna be a little bit different and maybe not for everyone. Marvel Knights. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut.